okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, fellow kids. Hope you're doing well out there. Today we're actually going to be talking about life in the Civil War and life as a soldier. So um, I'm going to include a lot of battle stuff in here and a lot of non-battle stuff, which maybe you didn't know. But we're just going to, this is going to be more of like kind of a collection of facts maybe than we would like, but that's okay. And you got a lot of other resources that are going to tell you about this kind of stuff that we're providing you with. So it's all right. So basically, what was the average soldier like? That's where we're going to start. Um, most of the people back then who are fighting, the average height, uh, what I've seen anyway, and I'm sure you can find different things, but is about 5'8 and 143 pounds. They're eating kind of a lot less than we are now because, I don't know, I haven't seen 143 pounds in quite a while, so... Uh, that was a while ago for me. Um, and they're probably going to be from a farm, whether they're from the north or the south. Obviously, if these are northern soldiers, they're more likely to be from a city um, than a southern soldier. But still, overall, most north is still small family farms. It's just the population is much larger. Uh, most of the soldiers are going to be white and Protestant. There are exceptions. There are very famous, let's say, like Irish Catholic regiments, for example, uh, your ages you're looking at are going to be in your late late teens to your mid-20s. So uh, it's definitely going to be a young man's fight. Overall, most of the common soldiers, if you're not an officer, are probably poor to middle class. Um, that especially ramps up. You have something called um, the Inscription Act or the Draft that comes on later where basically... It's not just volunteers fighting in our army anymore. You can basically be forced to join the army. That's going to cause a huge number of issues, and it causes even more issues because there's a policy in that law where if you have $300 that you can give the government, guess what? You don't have to go to war. You just get to give the government some money, or you can pay a substitute to go in your place. For a little reference, $300 back then was like kind of more like $50,000 now. Um, and it's, I hate always those historical money comparisons, but it, it was a lot of money. Uh, and your average worker or just farmer isn't going to be able to pay that. No way. Uh, so why are these people fighting? The ones who weren't drafted anyway. I guess that's one reason to fight. <laughs> you were drafted and now you have to. Um, most of it is going to come back to patriotism, whether you're talking north or south. Okay, these are people taking pride in the Union or in their homeland or sometimes even the northern soldiers still took a lot of pride in their states, and their states are a part of the Union, so they're going to fight. Uh, another motivation is adventure. You're going to talk about, you're talking about people who don't get away from home nearly as much as we do now. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and so a chance to go off and do something different. A lot of them thought it was going to be fun. War is not fun, kids. Don't forget that. Um, but the north... The basic reason generally was to preserve the Union. If you ask the average Northern soldier, why are you here? Why did you volunteer? To preserve the Union. We're, try, we're one country. We're going to keep it that way. Some early on might say to end slavery. There were abolitionists in the Northern Army. These would be seen as still an extreme point of view at the beginning. And by the end, it's going to be more and more people who are there to end slavery. Obviously, it's going to take a couple years. It's not until I believe it's 1863 when... African Americans are actually allowed to enlist in the Union Army, so it takes a while. Um, and then, obviously, that's going to up the numbers of people saying they're fighting to end slavery. In the South, uh, a Southern soldier would probably say they're there to protect their homes, their way of life, and um, maybe their state, something like that. Okay, so what was daily life like? Well, here's the first thing. Um, most of the time, these guys were not fighting. Very little time, if you take a total time of their lives in the Army, is spent fighting. Um, so they were probably pretty bored. But what they did, they did a lot of marching. Shoes were hugely important, right? Because you might march 20 miles a day. They drilled a lot. The way that they fought back then, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, you were a big unit of people, but you had to, every single individual had to know their place, know their job, know how to react to commands, and know how to identify those commands, sometimes over noise. So they would be drilled constantly, and sometimes that was not a very fun experience. Um, there's a very, very famous quote where, I'm paraphrasing now, which I shouldn't do, but 
there's a soldier in his little letter home. He says, we wake up, we drill, and then we eat breakfast and we drill. In between drills, we drill. So that kind of just tells you the importance of it. So I mentioned breakfast there, which makes you wonder, what were these guys eating? Well, the first thing you need to know, and this is where I really get it interested, um, is that they loved coffee. They were drinking coffee all the time. They were incredibly caffeinated armies, especially the North and the South. As the northern blockade takes hold, it's harder to get your coffee. They tried to make replacements. It wasn't the same, but especially in the north, they are caffeinated all the time. Uh, I have a quote here from someone I had looked up an article, and they were looking for big historical stories. You know, They were looking for the next big research in the Civil War, and they're looking through Civil War diaries. And it says, <laughs> and all they kept talking about was the coffee they had for breakfast or the coffee they uh, wanted for to have for breakfast. The word coffee was more present in these diaries than the words war, bullet, cannon, slavery, mother, or even Lincoln. So they really liked their coffee. I think I'd fit in I now that I've read that. So there you go. Uh, as far as what else they might be eating, there's this thing called hardtack, which they ate a lot of. And that is kind of like the most stale cracker you can imagine. And then imagine it's more stale. It wasn't very good, but it kind of keeps you full. And that's all that they could ask for. If they were lucky, they would have access to some vegetables and some like salted meat. Kind of think almost along the lines of jerky a little bit. Um, what caused the most death? Big part of war is going to be death. Well, first and foremost, it's disease. Around 600,000 people, and I say around because it's an estimate, could be a few more, could be a few less, and by a few I mean tens of thousands, so that's not a few. Um, around 600,000 people died in the Civil War, both sides, right? It's the bloodiest American war in history because both sides are Americans. So about 400,000 of those died by disease, not from battle or accidents or whatever, just from disease. Well, how can that be? There's a few things at play. First... Most of these soldiers, both sides, had never been more than like 20 miles from home. They lived within their own community. So disease did spread across the country. That still happened. There would be outbreaks. But that does something to your immune system where it doesn't have to deal with a ton of foreign germs all the time. So they're actually super susceptible to diseases because these armies might have, depending on where and when you're talking about, 50, 60, and sometimes even up to 100,000 people all in one place when you're used to just being around your small community of under a thousand people. So diseases broke out. There wasn't good sanitation in these camps, right? They're living in tents and everything's dirty and everything smells. I read another quote that said, everything and everyone in the Civil War smelled. <laughs> that was kind of fun. Um, but it means basically that there's a reason that we uh, have such a clean society and we still have to worry about outbreaks of things. Well, they had a dirty society and so it it got really bad. Um, and I am going to take a second to just talk about battle, which again, not as much a part of the daily life of a soldier, but a very important part, right? Because that's what they're there to do. They're there to go and fight battles. Um, but basically, the first thing you need to know, these battles are absolutely huge. A lot of them, not necessarily all of them, but they involve tens of thousands of people on both sides, two big armies going after each other. It's very hard to control that, um, the most common weapon that they have is something called a rifle musket. It's long enough, it's probably like three feet long, but it's long enough that basically we would consider it kind of unwieldy. You have to load it from the front, and you would generally have to load it standing up, which is very upsetting if you don't like getting shot at when you're standing up. Um, they fired these bullets, the mini ball, or mini ball if you're American, but they would basically, when they hit you, they would spread out and cause these terrible wounds and they'd shatter your bones and you'd have to get like your legs and arm amputated if you even survived. All sorts of terrible, terrible stuff. But the big problem, one of the things that made this war so bloody were the advancements in artillery, so that's like cannons, but also in this rifle musket thing. The tactics that both sides were using were developed probably about, oh, let's say 60 or 70 years earlier by a little guy named Napoleon. Maybe you've heard of him. Maybe. And they were developed for when guns could shoot probably about 50 or 100 yards. So if you close your eyes, you're on a football, imagine you're on a football field. They were using tactics for when you could shoot maybe one football field. Now they're shooting five football fields and they're using the same tactics. 
you would be clumped together with your unit with all your guys and you'd be charging at the enemy and you'd just be getting shot at. Usually, like, you might try and find a flank if you could or you'd be launching frontal assaults at the enemy. So these battles are actually incredibly deadly, especially um, for American history up to that time. Lots and lots of people are dying. And I think that's about it. I'm going to go ahead and stop because it has become a longer video than I intended. But you know me. That happens all the time. So hopefully you weren't too bored, and if you were, you can get over it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hope you guys have a good day.